So I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for coming to this conference on the use of big data to improve economic measurement. My name is Louise Shainer. I'm the Policy Director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy here at Brookings, where our mission is to improve the quality of fiscal and monetary policy and the public understanding of it. Um, this conference is part of a larger ongoing initiative on productivity measurement that we're doing here at Hutchins, uh, which we are undertaking with support from the Sloan Foundation, and Danny Goroff is here, thank you very much, and Antoine Van Akbel, who is also with us today. So thank you folks for being here. As you know, productivity growth in the U.S. has slowed over the past 15 years, and there's been this ongoing debate about whether or not that slowdown is real or whether it is because we're really increasingly unable to measure the real economy. So regardless of the answer to this question, that debate has refocused attentions, uh, attention on the shortcomings of the official measures and the challenges that the stati statistical agencies confront in keeping up with a rapidly evolving economy where cell phones are substitute for digital cameras, uh, services on the web appear to be free, and where increases in well-being and GDP and welfare are more likely to be through the quality of goods than the quantity, right? So, for the larger productivity initiative, we put together a panel of experts from, uh, from industry and academia, co-chaired by me, Janet Yellen, who is here very much, and Jim Stock, who's also here. Um, and we've commissioned about 15 papers on various aspects of productivity measurement um, that are now in the, in, you know, being written. Um, so stay tuned. We hope to see some of those papers possibly in the next year or so. Um, now, one issue that came up when we were thinking about this broader initiative um, is obviously about the potential for big data to address some of these measurement difficulties. Um, and luckily, the Conference on Research in Income and Wealth, the CRIW, was already involved in putting together a large conference on this very topic, and we actually decided we would work with them um, to highlight some of their findings and sort of in a, in a less technical, more public-facing um, uh, fashion. So that's what this is today. Um, so uh, we are highlighting two out of the paper, two of the papers from their conference, uh, and um, if you want to see all the other papers, they have a whole bunch of papers on this topic. You can search for CRIW on the web, and they have the full agenda and links to, uh, to the paper. So if you're interested, in, uh, please do that. And we are really grateful for the organizers of that conference, Catherine Abraham, Ron Jarman, Brian Moyer, and Matt Shapiro, um, who agreed to work with us and allow us to sort of you know, work with them to, to, to do this conference in conjunction with their conference this weekend, uh, tomorrow and, and Saturday. Um, Okay, so let me just tell, briefly tell you about the plans for this afternoon. So our first session is going to highlight two of the papers from that CRIW conference uh, with presentations by Jeremy Moulton from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and Claudia Sam from the Federal Reserve Board. And we'll follow up those presentations, which we'll have time for Q&A after those presentations, um, with a panel discussion that's really going to focus on the potential for big data to help us in improving economic measurement, but also the challenges and obstacles um, that need to be confronted in trying to use harness big data for official economic measurement. Um, and finally, we'll close with remarks by Brian Haskoten from the Committee on National Statistics. Harris, I got, I got, Coteen. Coteen, sorry, I asked him. I forgot. <laughs> uh, sorry. The Committee on National Statistics, who will talk about how concerns about privacy affect the prospect of using big data for economic measurement. Um, so uh, let me just note that this conference is being live streamed. We will be posting the video. Um, and thank you again for coming, and hope you enjoy this afternoon. And let's start with um, Jeremy. Well, thank you for inviting me to uh, share this work with you today. And I um, just want to say this is joint work with Marina Gendelsky and uh, Scott Wentland, who are over here with the uh, BEA. And they'll join me up here for Q&A. Uh, I need to make sure to express that these are, these are our views. These aren't the views of the BEA or the Department of Commerce or even the Zillow group. Um, now, the BEA, their main directive is to think about national accounts and how best to sort of measure those. One of those, most importantly, being GDP. And for today's talk, I want to focus on one component of one part of GDP. So consumption is one part of that. We're going to focus on this component called housing services, or space rents. How it's currently done at the BEA is that um, we think about homes that are rented, and we think about all other homes as well. 
And homes that are rented, we can go out and we can do a survey and sort of figure out how much are people paying in rent. And that was done in the residential finance survey um, back in 2001. And so we take that and we sort of spread it forward using data from the Census Bureau to change sort of housing quantities. Have those have increased over time or decreased, but mostly increased. And then how prices and quality have sort of changed using data from the BLS. Um, then you take those rental and you, and you think about, okay, well, if you owned a home, how much would you rent your house to yourself for is essentially what to think about it. And so using that data, they spread it across to sort of all owner-occupied homes. And so looking down here at sort of the first two columns, sorry, first two rows, we have rental of tenant-occupied homes and imputed rental of owner-occupied homes. And if you notice, about three-quarters of that value that's in that space, space rents or this housing services is actually this imputation of rents onto these owner-occupied homes. And we've gotten really interested in, in that part and also sort of in this rental part as well. This is what the data looks like currently. And so going back to about 2001, up to about 2016, we have in blue the PCE housing services number. And it looks pretty, pretty linear there. And then we also have what percent of GDP is this housing services? In, 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 in. So it looks like it's about 10 to 12 percent depending on the year. Um, this is what sort of made us think a little bit about this. If you look at housing prices, so this is the Case-Shiller index. Other indices look very similar. Anybody who's lived through this knows there was this big boom and then there's a bust, and it's sort of come back again. Um, and so we sort of thought, is there a way, and this, this whole paper is essentially a proof of concept, and it's another thought of, is there another way to think about housing services and different ways to sort of measure that? And the way that we're approaching this is going to take these prices a little more into account um, directly. And so to start with, I want to think about, are there pros and cons to the current approach? There's a lot of pros, and there's a few couple cons that I want to focus on. One of the pros is that it's the most common method that's used across the world. And rent is really this direct measure of what we want to think about when we're thinking about what the housing services is. So it's a direct measure of. And it's a reasonable approximation if you have pretty thick rental markets. So if there's a lot of rental units within an economy, it makes a lot of sense. Some of the cons are that not all economies have thick rental markets. Some of them are very thin. World Bank, I think, says if you have less than 25%, you should use this other method. I'm going to show you on the next slide. Um, and then this is the real big one, though. If you've ever lived in a rental and you've lived in an owner-occupied home, they're occasionally different. So I just, I've lived in the same house, it was built in the 60s for seven years, just bought a house, super different, very different houses. And so there are potential problems with trying to spread rental rates from rental properties onto sort of owner-occupied properties. Another one, and this is really relevant, I think, for this particular one, which is the data series can expire. So if I go back to here, the residential finance survey that they're using, 2001, was sort of benchmark last. There are, uh, um, they are sort of looking at other alternative data sources to sort of push this forward. But data series can expire. And so you have to sort of rely on other data to sort of help push this forward. Um, so what we're doing is, is in many ways a very different approach. It's, it's called user cost. And we're thinking about calling it essentially working from the bottom up. So we calculate a user cost or essentially a rental equivalence, sort of a user cost for every single home in the United States, and then we aggregate up to a national level, which is a very different approach. Uh, we think about it using capital theory. Essentially, what does it cost you to own that home? And we go through all sort of different components of that, one of the most important ones being sort of the price, interest rate, how much does it cost you to finance it. There's a risk premium associated with this, depreciation and maintenance, the house might fall apart, your property tax rate, and then do you expect this thing to appreciate or depreciate? And so the values that we're using here have been established sort of in the literature, and we're using those. The method has been established in literature. Our contribution to this is we're focusing on price, and we're focusing on the idea that we can build this bottom-up approach. And so to focus on that, I want to look at how do we actually figure out what the price for every single home in the United States is. Um, we use a hedonic model, and any realtor will tell you there's three things that are important for valuing a house, right? And they're all right up here, right? <laughs> location, location, and location. Those are the three most important things, right? They're right there. Um, we've got other stuff, but those are the three important things. And really, uh, it's, it's not just sort of where it's located, but it's also how big is your house? That's the square foot. How big is your lot? And then we've got other stuff, you know, bathrooms, bedrooms, how old is it, and so on and so forth. But really, those three things, the location, how big it is, and how big your lot is, and we're allowing those things to vary with location. So in New York, an extra square foot is going to be different than um, Chapel Hill, where I live, or something like that. Um, and so this is the model we're using. And we're using actual sales prices. So we observe sale prices across most of the US. And then we're going to spread those sale prices to every single house in the United States. 
here's where the data comes from. And this is one of our other huge contributions, I think, to this approach, is that we're able to actually observe real prices. And most of you have probably been to the Zillow's website. It was just redone recently, so I've, I've got new pictures up here. But if you haven't been, you get pictures. We actually don't have pictures, which is too bad. I have, in orange, things we don't have access to. So Zillow makes this data available to, resor to researchers, um, but some of the stuff uh, that they have, they actually can't release to us. And so I just want to make sure this is clear. We do not have the list price, which is what's up here at the top. We don't know what the house was listed for, but we do know how big it is. Four bedrooms, three bathrooms, 3,500-ish square feet. And we know exactly where it's located. We know the address. Every home. We also know what type it is. Is it single family? Is it a condo? Is it a townhome? How big is the lot? What year it was built? I got down here. How many stories is it? Does it have a deck? Does it have a pool? So on and so forth. We also have right now 2015's uh, tax amount. So how much did they pay in property taxes? How much was it assessed for? We also, so over here on the right, just to make clear, we know when the house sold. We know the day that it sold. But we don't know listings and we don't know sort of when prices change and so forth. That would be awesome to have, but we don't have that with the Zillow data. So down here we've got this, the little money sign there telling you you have that price. And the Zillow data is composed of two parts. One of those parts is the tax assessment data. And that one we think we have the universe essentially of all houses in the United States. And we know the characteristics of those homes. So we know how big they are, we know how many bedrooms and bathrooms they, are, they have. Uh, and so it's about 200 million parcels in 3,100-ish counties. This is the data set that we're going to spread prices across to. And then we use the transaction data, which we've merged onto this data, and this is where all the sales prices occur. So we see how much did it sell for, when did it sell for, did they have a mortgage, was there a foreclosure, so on and so forth. One issue with this data is that for the non-price disclosure states, we actually don't have their sales price. And so we need to actually, I'll show you in a minute, we're going to use census divisions when we do aggregation. We're going to have to assume that homes, sorry, states that are sort of in the same census division, but at least their price data are similar-ish, and we can sort of aggregate it from there. Now, there are other data sets we could use to get this price data, but for now, uh, we're using the Zillow data and um, try, trying to show that there's a proof of concept that this could actually potentially work. Um, Marina and Scott have done a comparison between Zillow's data and the American Community Survey, just to see, are they drastically different? Is Zillow giving us something totally different than what census gives? And for the most part, they look pretty similar, which is good. This makes us feel pretty good. Um, so here's the method. There's a lot of words here. You're not supposed to do this if you present, but I did it. So there's a lot of words here, and essentially what we do is we estimate a hedonic model. We try to figure out a predicted price for every single home in the United States using the sales that actually exist. We move on, and we estimate year-to-year -year growth in all those prices for every single county. And then we spread. We say, okay, if we have an actual price for your home, let's use that price. And then we're going to spread that price forward using uh, price changes um, within the county. If we don't ever observe uh, a, sale, a sale for the house, we use the predicted price from the hedonic model. Once we've done that, we calculate a user cost for every single house within the uh, area. Um, then we figure out what's the average user cost within that state for different bedroom types. And that's very similar to what um, they're currently doing, only they're doing it more on a national scale. So we have a five bedrooms, four bedrooms, so on and so forth. We know what the average user cost is in that state in that quarter. And then we sort of aggregate up using census divisions, um, using those values we get in part number seven. And we also use the quantities from the ACS. So we know year to year how home quantities are changing. And then obviously we aggregate up to the national level. And so I'm going to spend just a second on this slide just showing you the difference between SFR, single family residences, and the non-SFRs. But really I want to focus on these slides. These are the ones where I'm looking at sort of annual changes or annual values here. Um, the blue line here is our user cost method using the Zillow data. And the orange dashed line here is the current PCE housing values that are, are estimates from BEA right now. And they're actually very similar for the last several years, but they deviate during the boom, and, and beforehand, actually. Um, we also thought, OK, we've used some of the values that are in the literature. What happens if we change those a little bit? So on this slide right here, what we have in blue is our default. And our default includes the 10-year uh, treasury as sort of the value plus some sort of risk premium on top of it. If we instead use the 30-year mortgage rate instead and don't add that risk premium on top of it, we get basically the same thing. So the green line there is basically the same thing. And then if we say one of the components of the user cost was do we expect the home to appreciate or depreciate based on sort of what happened in the prior year, 
if we just we say, okay, the default is to use about 2%. A lot of countries use that when they're using the user cost. If we just throw that out, you actually get a slightly higher user cost. Same exact sort of uh, trends. If we use, there's an entirely different approach to how we think about appreciation of the home. If we assume that the year-to-year -year change in the uh, home's appreciation is what they expect it to happen for the next year, we get a sort of slightly different um, user cost trend here. So here's what it is with our default, where we're just assuming it's about a 2% growth rate. If we do it this way, we get, essentially, it shifts to the right. And that's because two things are happening. One is interest rates were low over here, and then the appreciation was exploding. And then over here on the right, the opposite is sort of happened in that middle part right there. Um, most people don't use this approach. Most countries do not use this approach. And if you were to sort of think of different values for this appreciation, you probably have something sort of in between these two. Um, Lastly, one of the, the sort of big contributions of using this bottom-up approach is that we can look at different areas of the country and sort of look to see what's happening with user costs. Um, and so what I have here are, here's all those different census divisions. And then in pink, we've got sort of the Pacific, which includes California, Oregon, Washington. You sort of expect that's probably going to have some of the higher sort of values for homes and things like that. And so that's why the, the values are so high there. Um, when you look at, these are single-family residences. When we look instead at uh, this should have updated, but non-single family residences, um, actually the mid-Atlantic, which includes like New York, actually becomes quite a bit higher as well. And so it allows us to sort of look at a more micro level at some, uh, some states even, uh, census divisions. You can also look at distributions of this rather than just looking at a single value. You can look at what's the distribution of the user cost within a state or within a, within a year even. Um, and so I just want to sort of fi finish here with some of the advantages that we see to using big data to estimate these sort of national um, statistics. Um, we're doing this micro to macro approach, and it allows us to do all these sort of different cuts to the data, um, different disaggregation. The other thing that we think is that we're using sort of actual market transactions. We're not relying on people to tell us, what do you think your house is worth? This is an actual price that actually occurred. Um, and then lastly is coverage. So we have, for the most part, a good percent of the United States that we can sort of observe and observe all these prices and calculate these statistics for. We also can observe homes that are going to be used as rentals or owner-occupied. We observe them all. And we can also look across the entire price distribution. So some very expensive homes are probably never going to be rented. And so it, you may never find a rental equivalence for those. And so uh, it allows us to sort of look across the entire distribution of the price. Um, and so again, this is just a proof of concept, and it's a potential alternative to be used. We're not sort of arguing that for sure this is the one that should be used, but we're just arguing this is a potential that could be used. And thank you. tell you and remind me if I don't do it uh, when you speak you have to hit this little mouth thing uh, on the uh, uh, on the microphone um, so I'm gonna open this up for questions in a second but I will have a few of my own um, some of it sort of clarification uh, actually a few little questions so this was all about nominal housing services so how do I so what is it is this all about the deflator or is it about the real so what what are your things do to real GDP uh, Yeah, so we, we, we started with, is this microphone? Yeah, so, so yeah, we, uh, we started with nominal. Oh, sorry? Oh, all right. Can, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so we started with nominal. So all of our, all of our figures are currently in nominal. Um, I think sort of the next step is sort of how we might think about it. But as a component of PCE, uh, this, you could, in theory, uh, build this into... Um, constructing a different PCE measure if you would, um, if you want to go that route. So yeah, this this is not something that we have redone in our current. current you have paper. figured out what the yeah, implications yeah. would be for real GDP. Yeah. Um, because I guess the deflators are coming right. from that. <laughs> like I said, uh, so the, so the deflators would be coming from BLS still, and then you would put it whatever you haven't you haven't gone to that step. But it's because I had a question about how to think about sort of the user costs and amenities and when 
uh, so an amenity changes and the price changes, do we think of that as more real services or the price of services? And what, if you were, didn't change the price, would this be more real services that you would be getting? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so to the extent that uh, amenity values are going to be capitalized in rents, that you would, you would sort of see that in the rental data, right? So when Amazon chooses to uh, reside in Northern Virginia, um, you start to see rentals creeping up because of you know, the convenience of being close to Amazon in, in Arlington, Virginia. So that's sort of an amenity and other amenity factors. Um, and that's, of course, going to be bid into prices. And so I, I would say, yes, that would sort of be directly... Um, a factor that I would I think is real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm looking at the rental equivalents versus your user cost, how do you think about why they're so different? Is that something about the rental market not? Uh, just how, how do you think about that? Because in theory, if they were sort of the same, I understand there's some things that are never rented, but your your theoretical construct should be the same, right? Or is that not right? I mean, I, I think we talked about this yesterday. Um, there are papers that actually show that rental rates and these PCE measures actually don't don't track very closely, not super closely. Ah. And so, I don't know. I don't know how far I want to go with, with that, but I think there are some potential issues with, with how it was spread forward from 2001 when the last RFS was done. But I'll let you talk. Yeah, there's some <laughs> issues with the data. that There's recent literature on computing rental, rental indices uh, for the U.S. and also major major markets, and there are using different data and different methods. Uh, recent literature has found that um, the BLS's approach and the BEA's uh, BEA's approach for um, with this rental data that people have found um, actually different time series dynamics with the with using the different data and different methods. And so, whether BA and BLS is absolute truth, we you know, have no comment there. So, I see. Yes. So I shouldn't interpret the differences as being a difference of a user cost method versus a rental method yeah. necessarily, yeah. but everything that goes into having different data set, different, uh, everything like that. That's yeah. interesting. Um, okay. Uh, questions from the audience? Uh, Antoine? So uh, please uh, wait for the mic and state your name. Tell us where you're from. Uh, Antoine van Achmaal, Brookings Trustee. Uh, two questions. Um, the first is... Did I understand you correctly that your method, at least intuitively, um, it would seem that it, it gives you a better sense of how inflation feels because it's used on user data. So that's the first question. And the second question is what I thought was very interesting was that uh, in this graph... Uh, and in how you compute it, you didn't show the impact of the stock market on housing transactions, which we know, with the lagged effect, is usually there. Yeah, so uh, generally when we show the graph of looking at the um, any sort of the, the BA, BLS's, uh, series on on housing and using relying on this rental data, um, at least for most of us who have experienced the the housing boom and bust the last twenty years, it doesn't quite feel right. And so, from based on the the experience, and so if you're in the mid middle of the in the middle of the two thousands and um, you're you're seeing inflation numbers uh, that are pretty pretty low, but yet you're seeing house price inflation, at least measured within the house price indices, exploding, there, there feels like that tension, that, that inconsistency, and that's a little bit of what we're sort of getting at. Yeah. Yeah. So my question was, do, do your user data, does your user data approach actually improve on that, which I thought it would? Yeah. Yes. I, that's right. I think that. Yes, it does, because uh, sort of the, the, the core of our measure is house prices. That's right. Martin Bailey, Brookings. So, so just help me understand. You got this big jump. So the BLS measure is pretty flat, and you got this big jump. Mm -hmm. All right. So during this period, uh, purchase price of houses went way through the roof and then came down. So That's is right. that basically what you're reflecting? Essentially. Because yes. the if you're thinking about the user cost of housing, it's true that the the purchase price went up, mm -hmm. but if you were expecting inflation to continue. Um, then it, it didn't look like the, the rental cost of, I mean, the implicit rental cost, because you were going to get a 10% uh, 
uh, gain in the value of your house. Yeah. And that's one reason everybody was rushing to buy houses. Yes. It's not because the houses look cheap. The houses look very expensive. But people thought they were going to essentially be uh, cheap is the wrong word, but yeah. they, the, the, the cost was going to be low because the price was going to be even higher the following year. So yeah. just help me understand how sure. those things play out in the picture that you describe. So if you looked at, I think it was the third picture, where we used the alternative approach to looking at appreciation, which actually incorporated year-to-year -year changes in the price rather than assuming a 2% appreciation, you actually notice that the user cost actually doesn't rise until, when was it, 2000. It's much later. And so actually during the, during the sort of escalation of it, you actually do see with that approach, the user cost does not explode initially because people expect this sort of 10% appreciation in their home price. And that's actually sort of reducing the user cost. Yeah. Wait, can I follow up? So, so there's kind of this period where expectations of price changes are going down, but actual prices haven't, don't go down? Or so it's like, how does that? So, I mean, I mean, initially, it was sort of prices were going up right. and appreciation exactly. was going up. And so that's one of the reasons why I push it this way. And then right. I think it must flip at some point where yeah, people are still exactly. expecting it to be higher, but then prices are not doing that. They're doing the opposite of anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, Chris McCray. So I was interested, uh, how micro does your locations effects model get yeah. in, say, cities where there's a lot of redlining, you know, Chicago, Baltimore? Yeah. Uh, are you able to do any yes. expansionary work in that kind of level of detail? Yes. So we have tried to get down as low as possible as far as location is concerned. I think our current one uses census tract. And what we've done with the current model is essentially we run one model at the census tract level if there are at least 10 sales within the quarter. And then we could move up to the uh, FIPS or the county, and then we move it to the state for those areas that don't have at least 10. We could go smaller in some areas, I think. We could go to a census block group maybe in New York or other areas like that where you actually have sort of money more, many more sales at the small geogra geographic level. We don't want to go too low if there's not enough sales to sort of calculate these hedonic price models. But we've tried to go as low as possible geographically to get around things to, to, you know, for reasons like this. Yeah. Rob? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Rob Siemens from NYU. Uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, you motivated it by talking about how housing matters for calculating GDP. Mm -hmm. Have you gone through the exercise of re sort of recalibrating what GDP should have been, you, you know, using your method? And I'm just curious. That's about, a good question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I take it the answer is no, but I would love to see that. <laughs> no, but yes, we do have some follow up projects that are doing exactly <laughs> that. Yes. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, Marshall. Oh, we can go back there because the microphone. Then we'll get to Marshall. Thank you, Danny Bachman uh, at Deloitte. Um, I'm trying to get my mind around that hump because in real terms, the housing stock and the actual amount of housing people consume didn't really change, right? You're living in a house, the house is the same, the value of the house goes up, but you're still living in the same house, and then the value of the house goes down, but you're still consuming the same house. So presumably you could only use this if you had a proper price index that went along with it, which I, th I guess is the question you were asking at the beginning, right? This only works if you, if you have a consistent price index that picks that up. Yeah, that's probably the biggest challenge for converting this to real, sort of some, a, a real measure. Um, but this is also sort of a, a fundamental question about economic measurement more broadly, that when we see prices go up, the question is how much of that is purely monetary inflationary versus how much is a real quality change. And has, if we see prices going up, is that reflecting some underlying amenities? That was a question earlier. Or is it reflecting some, something else that um, may not actually be quote unquote real? And so that, yes, that is a fundamental question and something that we should um, think a bit more about. Yeah. Marshall, up here. Giving you a workout, how when? Uh, Marshall Reinsdorf, IMF. Uh, Couple of questions. Easy one. Uh, age has a nonlinear effect on price. I, I assume you guys have modeled that and you didn't put it in linear. Uh, but the next question I wanted to ask you know, if you look at the long term profile of your estimates, it's pretty flat, right? Not a lot up for 15 years. Uh, and you wonder, you know, my impression is house prices went up a lot in 15 years. And uh, okay, so why is it so flat? I think, well, okay, interest rates came down, that depresses your user cost, right? But you might think, I don't know what happened to the stock of housing. 
it'd be really useful to try to decompose, see if you can come up with a price and quantity components, because I think most of what you're getting is really prices moving around. But if you have any comments on why is it flat and what's driving the movement, it'd be interesting. So one of the things that we want to look at in terms of stock of housing is uh, how to weight the Zillow data. So one of the really important challenges with big data is precisely how representative is it? Because in order to do the kind of decomposition that you're describing, which is really important, we need to know what we're truly capturing. And so one of the things we're doing right now is linking it on an address level to census data. This link is in progress, and uh, we are at the stage where we're going to start the analysis. And that will give us a sense of what happened to the housing stock, and are we actually measuring whether that change is reflected in our transactions. Else? Okay, I'm going to ask you one last question. Then. So is this, is this something that BA is thinking about doing? Is this a proof of concept for them, or is this just an academic project? Or? <laughs> yeah, so, so given the current series um, and, and the fact that um, it was last benchmarked in 2001, uh, we are exploring, and this, was, this came up at the last advisory committee meeting, that we're exploring different ways in which to improve this measurement. And so a couple different ways. The thing about it is we have, um, you know, you could look at different data but the same method. Uh, which is something that uh, one of our colleagues uh, is looking at using a different census data but using this rental equivalent method. Um, or you could look at um, a big data like, like ours, so different data, and a different method. And so that's one of the things that we're exploring. And so once we sort of look at to see what's possible given existing data, we'll then evaluate sort of what are the pros and cons for all of them and, and make it that determination later. Yeah. Great. Uh, one last question back there. Where's Helen? Here she comes. <laughs> Hi, Andrew Reamer, George Washington University, and a member of the BEA Advisory Committee. Um, one of the BEA's innov innovations in the last decade that Marshall was involved with was the regional price parities. It looks at the cost of living across the country, and a key component of that is housing. I believe Marshall, the uh, source is the American Community Survey. So I'm curious what the potential is for your method in, for use in regional price parities to actually improve the measures of cost of living uh, relative to uh, the U.S. as a whole. Sure. So my understanding of it is one of the key key components of that measure is uh, looking at the price to rent ratio. And so one of the things that we're working on with the linked census data is potentially to get a richer um, uh, a, a, a richer conception of like what what that is using this blended data. So that's sort of something we're going we're to we're look at and explore in the, in the coming years once we have linked data. And, and we can sort of use both the ACS and the Zillow, Zillow data together. So that's, that's one of our, that's where we're headed. Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking this panel. What I'm going to share with you today is our efforts to take a very large data set of card transactions translate those into a new measure of consumer spending. And then I'm going to spend a lot of my time today showing you an example, just one example of how we've been using these data to study economic activity. So I'd already mentioned I have a great co-author team on this project. I also want to point out in our acknowledgments list, which is pretty lengthy, there were many contributors in constructing these data, other colleagues at the board, and in addition, staff at both First Data and Palantir. So this is, I mean, a, big data is a big effort to put together. And one last note, I just want to be clear that all of uh, this research and the views I'm going to express today are those of the authors on this paper and not anyone, uh, uh, not necessarily in the Federal Reserve System or other uh, company partners. Okay, so I want to start by motivating this with, with a question and really like the, the purpose of this analysis and, and not just this project that we're doing with card transactions. There's other work at the board under our economic measurement agenda of trying to find ways to use big data from private sector sources to get a better view of economic activity. And the question is, can these big data really help us improve and support macro policy? 
And so staff at the, at the Federal Reserve for, for many years with many uh, official statistics, existing data sets have spend time trying to characterize current economic conditions and also using that to be able to forecast conditions. And this is one piece of important piece of information in kind of supporting the policy making process. Now we're going to hear a lot today about the, the promises and the challenges of big data. I also wanted to highlight a few pieces of this that I think are particularly important thinking about it being in a, in a macro policy setting. So clearly there is a huge promise of a massive amounts of very detailed data that businesses are producing just by doing their business operations. So this has a real potential if we can harness and tap into that data to fill in gaps uh, in official statistics. One, one aspect that is very promising is to get more information on geography, on higher frequencies. In, in this kind of policy setting, it helps us really be confident of what shocks we're identifying. When we see movements in spending, we can very clearly say, uh, we think it's because of this weather event or it's because, the, you know, there was an oil price change and this is an area of the country that's very intensive uh, employment in that industry. So it helps us understand why, why we're seeing movements in, in activity. And then another feature that's very important is these data can be very timely. And, and that helps in terms of, uh, in a policy process, you can't wait for all the revisions and years for the data to come out. And so this has a potential to give us some additional information uh, without much delay. So those are a lot of things speaking for this kind of effort. There are many challenges as well, and this, is, this came up in the earlier conversation as well. These data are produced in doing business. They are not produced for creating economic statistics. Things like representativeness, that, like this is a picture of the U.S. economy as a whole, is not guaranteed. And also in terms of our official statistics, there's a lot of theory and rigor that goes into the construction of those statistics. Those same methods can be very hard to point at big data. And particularly in our case, like we, were, we ended up developing new methods in a very different approach. Um, and you want to have the same kind of confidence in the big data you're using if you're going to bring it into important um, uh, policy discussions. And then a second piece that's important thing about macro policy is that most of these big data haven't been around that long. So you end up with fairly short time series. Our, our uh, spending series begins in 2010, so we don't see a full business cycle in our, in our data. And so we think our methods work pretty well in the time period we've seen, but that doesn't mean uh, that they would hold up as well in like sharp changes in economic conditions. And so you, you have, it's very difficult to compare your recent estimates with past events. But all that said, we think you know, there's a lot of promise to this and have uh, pushed forward with this and other efforts. Okay, so I did also want to point out, and I think it's important because I'm going to show you our series, some case study examples, but this really is a very collaborative effort and it takes a lot of uh, cooperation at various points in the process. So private companies that are willing to share their data for economic statistics, I mean, this is an important public good and it is not a trivial thing to ask of companies to, to partner with because their data is very important to their business. Um, there are lots of privacy issues and so um, those who do, are, this, is, this is really a big opportunity. We are uh, very thankful to be partnering with First Data, which is a large uh, payment technology company. And, and so they, uh, First Data processes about $2 trillion of card transactions annually. In terms of the data, this is uh, debit cards, credit cards, any ele electronic payments using a card. So um, you know, we're covering a lot, of, a lot of spending, but it's still one company. It's not um, the full economy. When, as, so that's our, our data source, but then in the processing of the data, we work with, uh, again, this becomes a multidisciplinary effort because to help ensure the privacy of the data, we use an intermediary of Palantir that works with the raw data. All of the series that at the board we have access to have been anonymized. Uh, they, uh, so that we don't have merchant identifiers. We um, have to be in a geography where there's enough coverage um, that you couldn't re-identify. Uh, merchants, and so then those anonymized data sets are what we used, but it was also very important, even though we don't have access to the raw data, it was very important for us to be active participants in the construction of the indexes. Like we really needed to understand what transformations of the data were being done, what kind of filtering was being done, and so that's where we were, uh, have and continue to work very closely um, in those, those efforts. 
And then finally, I just want to be clear that this type of work would not have been possible without also relying on official statistics and working with individuals at the statistical agencies. I'm going to show you, it, we, we um, take the step of comparing our new indexes to official statistics. That's part of having confidence in our, our estimates and being willing to use them in economic analysis. But they also uh, are part of the, of the um, method in the building of the indexes. So really, we couldn't do this kind of work without um, the official statistics as well. OK, so I want to show you. Uh, just some of a little bit about the the data that we're using. So and and to to show how important uh, this this filtering and aggregation of the data are. Um, so what I'm showing you here is just the the, the um, 12 month change. So over a year, the change in total uh, dollar transactions that we see. Um, from and this is within uh, spending at retail stores and restaurants. So we've focused in on our analysis on just a piece of of the transactions that first data would cover. Uh, this is very intentionally uh, we chose this group because this is uh, a similar concept that uh, BEA uses when they construct GDP from the census retail sales. So we're kind of matching up concepts. And what you see here on the right is before we do anything to the data, the, the first data has these massive increases in, in retail spending in this area. So um, in 2014, like 250% increase. That is not what was happening in the US economy in 2014. So you see as a comparison that the same census series is just on a different like magnitude here. And so what, what this is, and, and this um, was a really important issue for us to address, but this is going to show up in a lot of big data. The changes in this data are, you can have big changes driven by the business operations. So this was a period of expansion for first data, not just like adding new merchants, but acquiring other payment processors. So you have really large increases in the amount of dollar transactions uh, that they are, they're capturing. That tells us something about one company. It doesn't tell us about the US economy. So it's important for us to, to filter a lot of that information out so that it can be usable in analysis. Now, I'm not going to go through uh, our filtering process. I'm happy to answer more questions about that. But we, um, uh, the, the goal of our filters is to really focus on those, the changes in activity that are picked up in the card transactions that, that we think have, are economically meaningful. So not just specific to the business operations. And after we go through a process of filtering and aggregating, we now see that the first data series matched up in a similar way. So again, these are 12 month changes, national data have a very similar pattern to uh, the census data at the same uh, frequency. This makes us feel much more confident about using the data and particularly going off and using it for its geographic detail or its like daily aspects. So this was an important uh, step in our process. Okay, so now I wanna turn to a, an example of how we've used these data. So uh, what I'm gonna focus on is our uh, estimates of the economic impact of Hurricane Harvey and Irma on retail spending. And what this is showing you is, uh, and is just the kind of the tracking of the hurricanes. We're going to be using our state level estimates of the spending effects. This is in a kind of a regression setting where we're taking into account the day of the week effects, uh, other um, seasonal effects. And so you can see um, that, and I'll show you some more uh, how these estimates look. But one thing that was really notable about this is we received these transaction data within three days of the event. So when we were, when we were doing our first estimates of, of these effects, it was as the hurricane had just passed through and there was still disruption. And so it was, very, it was a very different experience to kind of measure and examine this kind of disruption in real time. Okay, so with the estimates sitting still, uh, <laughs> so you can watch the pictures. Um, this, this is using the state level data. We do an estimate of the, the impact of the, the hurricane on national daily spending, OK? And so what you can see here, uh, for, for Hurricane Irma, the, uh, at, shortly after landfall, there it depressed uh, national retail spending by about 7%. With Harvey, it was about 2.5%. These are about 3%. 
these differences really reflect the fact that uh, the population affected by the two storms was different. So Irma went through Florida, that was a larger population. But you can see the basic pattern of the hurricane effect is there's a disruption soon after the storm hits. Uh, within a week or so, spending is back about to the level it would have been in the absence of the hurricane. And then what you don't see is shortly after the hurricane, a burst of spending to make up that lost spending. Right, so within this time frame, what we're really seeing is a loss in spending that occurred as the storm happened. Another aspect we can do with these data is look at the, the very localized effects of the storm. And so here we're, we're using the metro level data, and you can see again that the spending is depressed uh, immediately after the storm hits. There are, um, but these are, these are huge effects. So when you look at the local data, for the, for the metro areas that are in the direct path of the storm, you're seeing spending fall by 75%, almost 100% at the time of the hurricane. But the basic pattern of it falls sharply and recovers, and again, you don't see kind of this burst of makeup spending. So that's uh, with the detailed data. And then, um, what, again, to go back to the kind of macro setting, we want to take these estimates and think about um, how, how these are affecting national GDP, say, at the quarterly uh, frequency. And what we, what we see is that when, when you go to think about the, the national effects, what's important is the severity of the storm and, as I mentioned before, the population that's affected. So you think of kind of the, the consumer spending that's at risk when the event happens. And, and unlike... Um, other where you kind of, you know, look at average effects over past weather events and do an estimate of what, what this storm would be, we're actually observing this particular storm, this particular hurricane, and seeing what its impact was and then being able to aggregate that, that up. So it's a different exercise, and the details do matter in terms of um, the, the storm itself. And, and as I mentioned before, the, the geographic, the daily data really allow us to, to say with some confidence that what we're seeing in terms of a disruption we think is happening at the national level is being driven by this weather event as opposed to some other thing that could be happening in the economy in the same month or in the national level where you'd have the regular data. And so putting, putting all these pieces together from these two hurricanes, we estimate that the uh, Harvey and Irma depressed GDP growth in the third quarter of 2017 by a half a percentage point. And so this is just the direct effect from these uh, spending components, but that's um, uh, not a trivial amount. And, and so then in conclusion, uh, as I said before, you know, we're, we are still at the early stages of, of using these data and other types of big data um, to in, in a macro policy setting for analysis. This requires a development of new techniques and there is definitely a need to scrutinize the data quality. And, th and that's an ongoing uh, uh, need because these, the data that are created in business operations, things can change about the business So You have to constantly be monitoring uh, the quality of the data you're using. Uh, we, the ability to do high frequency localized events uh, allows us to kind of fill some gaps in studies that would be possible with official statistics. And a couple of examples, we've looked at the delay in the reimbursements or the payments for the earned income tax credit. Uh, and also we've been able to use these data to look at sales tax holidays um, across various states. Uh, so, and then finally, one, one piece that is useful, and this goes back to the idea of we're not trying to replace official retail sales statistics, and in fact, it can be very powerful to use these in conjunction, because this is a very different data source, so, so you have the ability to have an independent read on the same economic activity, and this can help in real time. Any, any measure, even official statistics, there's some degree of measurement error, and so if we can use our estimates in conjunction with official statistics, it could give us a better picture of the actual underlying activity at that time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Those graphs are so much fun. I know we all look at, love looking at those things. It's just kind of amazing. Uh, not the moving ones even, but just the pictures of how much it affected spending. So let me, uh, so 
I want to sort of ask about how we think about the value of this. And you just said something about like knowing what that hurricane effect is. So that I could sort of think of it different pieces. And one of the things is like when we're looking at GDP one year versus GDP another, and we want to correct for extraordinary things like the hurricane, it's kind of the only way of, of knowing apart from like, you know, it was X percent of the population and we, right. But so, um, so I think about hurricane effects. I remember, you know, we spent weeks and weeks at the Fed trying to figure out what those were. So this is cool to be able to actually have data. Um, uh, David asked me here, ask her about whether or not it was useful for the shutdown um, and whether or not you would be using that to underst understand shutdown effects. Um, so like what other, what other things have you used it for? Um, yeah, no, and I think, um, and this is part of where we're still, I'm sorry, still at the early stages of using the data. And I, because of, and a very important part of our process was to feel comfortable with the data and, and, you know, to get to the place where you had a, a high positive correlation with census that, that took, that took a while. Um, so we, we, um, and, and part of our validation for the data was, was using it and testing it on events where we really felt like we knew what we were going to see. So it, it is nothing new to think about when a hurricane comes through, a large winter storm, that that's going to depress economic activity and it's gonna be a temporary depression, you know, that it, yes. it bounces back. So um, we started in a space where we felt comfortable where we would kind of see the effects, but even there we did learn things in terms of a weather effect. This, the idea that you don't have a rapid makeup and spending yeah. afterwards, that we didn't see any evidence of that, that was a piece where we were adding some data to kind of the rules of thumb are different than that. So it's a transitory event. It's not, so I don't think, we, we didn't like change kind of the view of how you think about weather effects, but we're bringing additional information. In terms of, um, in terms of how, how, we can, how we use these data just kind of in general, the fact that they are very timely. So we receive only a few days after the end of the month do we have our first read for the prior month. Um, and we have gone through a lot of effort to, to feel comfortable with the monthly changes. We do seasonal adjustment on these data. I mean, all of which are non-trivial uh, things to do with the transaction data. But then typically the advance read for the retail sales comes out about two weeks after the end of the month. So there is a period where we have an early read over the data. I mean, it's two weeks, right? <laughs> um, but in addition to that, the idea, we have looked at, um, uh, so it, typically it's two weeks, right? So we have, but there's also the, the, that advanced reading will often revise, so the census data. And what we've done is looked at our ability to predict revisions to the census yeah. data when we also have our first data measures. And, and it does in fact help predict revisions. So you can imagine if you have a month, say like December, where there's a really large change in retail sales and the official statistics, our, our independent data can help us assess that to see do we think that that was a real change or will that is that something we would likely expect to to revise away over time mm -hmm. so all the filtering and stuff that you did so did you so have you like done i guess out of sample predictions with it after or is it you know i do all this stuff and i match it but that's because i did the stuff kind of knowing i was trying to match it or you know what i'm saying um right so we weren't um uh so there's um we weren't, I wouldn't say we were doing out of sample predictions and it's not, it's not like we were testing various methods and waiting until we got the correlation up yeah. to a certain amount. I mean, there, there's very good reasons to expect somewhat different movements over time. Um, uh, but it was more just a, uh, quick check on like, are we able to, to, to see the kind of patterns that we think are economic activity. And so the little difference between the, the, um, the housing one and this is that sort of the Fed is not the producer of the data, so you're not thinking about it as an alternative in terms of the data production. Um, you know, and, but maybe eventually it could be used by the agencies to, to help with their, with their official data, right? And I don't know if they, how you think about that at all. Um, right, well, and, and I would say, like, they're... Um, there are many things that one could do with the transaction data. So th this is very detailed data. I mean, it's essentially card swipes at merchants that, that partner with First Data or one of their affiliates. And we know uh, the industries that those merchants are in. Um, you have very uh, high frequency data. So like the application that we took to this, because we were trying to get these 
um, fit it into the macro looking at time series. That's not, that isn't the only application of these data mm -hmm. and, and you could do much more um, uh, detailed, uh, detailed analysis with it. And, and in fact, other statistically have been working with and kind of trying to think about ways to use these kind of data. Mm -hmm. Ah, David. David Wessel, uh, three questions. One, what, my question about the shutdown was, in real time, when you didn't get census data because they, they couldn't produce it, was this alternative source valuable? Or is it we're not there yet? Two, do you have to pay first data for this? And three, creeping up on the question that Louise asked, do you think that this data could substitute for the retail sales data that the census collects, or is it just a supplement? Okay, so I'll, I think I'll take them in, in reverse order. So I, I want to be like I don't. We don't see this as a replacement for official statistics. I mean, this is not. Um, I think our our main goal for this was to be able to use it to think about the geographic dimension, the the daily frequency. So it's kind of expanding into areas that we that we can't use the retail sales for. If if given a choice, and even after spending, you know, investing a lot of time and building these series, like if I had to choose between them, I would use the, the census retail sales without a question. I mean, it's just, it's really hard uh, to deal with representativeness of the data. Um, so this is not a replacement. And in constructing our, one of the ways that when we constructed the methods to deal with the representativeness is that we use the economic census so those are every five years, and we use them to, to uh, benchmark our measures. So we, we feel comfortable using first data to get a sense of growth rates in, say, a particular retail industry, but, but to deal with the fact that the mix of merchants that first data might have in that industry could be different than the overall economy, it's really great to be able to anchor those growth rates at a point in time with kind of representative levels. Uh, so. So we definitely need the official statistics even to, to put together what we have. Um, in terms of uh, pushing more on like the, the timeliness of the data and the use in the shutdown, I, I mean, this, this is one, I mean, this was, uh, these were data that we had available at that time. Um, and so that, that does, uh, it, it both increases their usefulness. It also is one where um, it, you know, uh, these are these are research experimental series, and so like it does put a lot of pressure on them too. Um, and 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 we can certainly have. Um, uh, there's a lot of the the business operation, the pipeline, and and so things can happen like, oh, the pipeline wasn't working for two days, and so the first estimate ended up getting revised. And I mean, these are just business process. That this is this is a lot of data we're pushing through a system. And, and, and it, can have, it can have issues. So it, it is the case that, that um, having that data continuing, getting early reads is helpful, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't change the fact that we're eagerly, eagerly <laughs> anticipating the, the census data when it came out. So dollars. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm not gonna get into the, the arrangement with the, the, the collaboration, so. Okay, great. Uh, back there. Thank you very much, Spencer Hill from Goldman Sachs. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. I was wondering, uh, first off, if you could, if you're able to um, just share your your, uh, your sense of whether uh, retail spending did in fact uh, decline sharply in December and only partially rebound in January. I think that's a question a lot of us are grappling with. Um, but my question, my, my actual question was actually about uh, just the other service categories, particularly those in the, uh, the QSS, the quarterly census sur uh, survey. Um, is uh, have you found that your data also may be useful as a early read on um, service spending in say the recreation or information services categories for consumers? This seems like you know a potentially useful uh, input in the advanced GDP report, for example. Okay, so so I'm not going to comment on any specific estimates from December or January from these data. I'm kind of going to stick to the the cleared research paper uh, that I was presenting. <laughs> Um, but those are those are good questions. Um, uh, so, um, and I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. Uh, in terms of in terms of thinking about this for the the QSS, um, 
we so we we very specifically focused in on on a subset of retailers and restaurants because again this was like a concept and census that we track and look at a lot in the retail uh, sales report that does not mean that that's the only piece of data that is well covered by first data it's just where we started in terms of our methodology so you can think of with with these card uh, with these transaction data Anything that is paid for predominantly by a card or has a high volume of the spending done by a card are ones that we can cover. And so we certainly have started to, to look at um, accommodations, hotels, uh, recreation as a space um, that we can also look at. Uh, I will say, I mean, there's... Uh, there's also, when we go to build these uh, estimates, we do have to take um, the mapping from the merchants that, that partner with First Data. They use merchant uh, classification codes. We have to map those into the North American industry classification system. So even just kind of setting up and organizing the data uh, isn't um, a trivial thing. So, but, but there is the potential to kind of move into those, uh, those spaces. And there you are, you can be improving uh, you know, timeliness here, we're getting a couple weeks on a monthly series. There you could be getting um, mm -hmm. even more advanced on a, on a quarterly series like that. Oh, another. Andrew Reamer, George Washington University. <clears throat> Last month, the Census Bureau announced it's creating an arrangement with the NPD group to get a data feed of, of third-party retail data uh, to actually reduce the burden on uh, response of the, of the monthly retail survey. So I'm curious, um, has the Fed been in touch with the Census Bureau? So have you advised them on first data vis-a-vis vis -vis NPD group data, uh, or are these two um, operations kind of running independently of one another? Yeah, so again, I don't, I don't want to speak for other agencies and other projects going on. I mean, I think I kind of gave the blankets that statistical agencies are very interested in these alternative uh, data sources. I mean, you already saw that in the, the first presentation. Um, and actually, there's quite a bit of work. I would encourage everyone to take a look at the CRIW conference and kind of see some of the work. And I believe there's a, a, a paper with NPD data uh, that's being presented um, in that conference. So, so I think that there's a lot of Activity and the the point that you made about reducing respondent burden. I mean that that is an important. I mean that that is one advantage of using of using these data. Are, are there distinct differences between first data and NPD data in terms of coverage or detail or quality reliability? Yeah. So I think what's interesting with these big data is the the data generating process or the way these data come about can can differ quite a bit. So uh, in our case, what we're seeing is. We see card transactions, but only at merchants that work with first data, right? So, so we don't, like, um, for other data sets, you might, it might be um, where you have the households as a unit of analysis. So you can see their card payment. You only see a set of households that work mm -hmm. with, say, a financial institution, but you see all of their card payments. With the MPD data, these are like, I, so like scanner data. So... Mm -hmm. There, you know, it's like at the, the point of sale, and, and then you might, um, there you might be more limited to the types of merchants and the product categories, you know, so you might have very, so I think this is one of those things, if, if it's in kind of the sweet spot of that data set, there, there's a different answer to the question of like which data set would be preferable. So it's really going to depend on the question, question you're answer. asking. And, and I will say, I mean, with our data set, because it's, it, we have very merchant centric data, it, it does kind of line up with uh, census retail sales, which is a firm survey with establishments in the retail sector. So that kind of makes a natural pairing for benchmarking. Other big data that would be more household specific would need to kind of benchmark and compare to household surveys. Um, so that's one thing. Oh. Jim. Jim Stock. Um, so this is a big step forward in real-time monitoring. I remember uh, I was involved in trying to uh, monitor the economy during the previous government shutdown, and it was tough, and it would have been great to have had data like these. I guess the one question I have, um, you say that there is like a, I think, a half percent 
half a percentage point uh, drop in uh, or f shortfall in GDP growth in Q3. And I wonder if there's coverage issues there. And I, I guess what I'm thinking is that sort of some conventional wisdom is uh, there's a decline in consumption and so forth, but then you actually have to do all of this rebuilding, and that rebuilding generates an awful lot of economic activity uh, and might even overcompensate for the drop. And would it be possible that some of that activity might be going outside of, well, your sampling frame or outside of your data set, uh, which is, I think, essentially consumer credit card transactions? So I guess it's a question. This is a question about external validity for longer-term effects. Right. Well, and what what we are sharing this half a percentage point lower GDP growth. This is this is purely a direct effect from this only this one channel, right? Because even you could imagine an inventory offset or like it doesn't. This doesn't have to show through to GDP. So both even within that quarter, there could be other effects that are happening and, and certainly um, rebuilding effects afterwards. So yeah, this is just one one piece of that. Martin, up here. How do you adjust for differential use of uh, cards so that over time um, a lot of people played cash and, and now you buy a cup of coffee with a credit card mm -hmm. and it's getting to the point you buy it with your phone, although that goes through a credit card. But mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, people at different income levels use uh, credit cards differently and maybe some people... Uh, want to use cash because it's more anonymous. How do you adjust for that differential uh, use? Right. Well, I would say there there are some advantages of having a short time series. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, look for the positive. Um, no, but it is true. I mean, one piece we're missing any cash transactions, and so so one thing we have looked at is like with the uh, diary of payment consumer choice about 30% dollar value of, of payments that households make are through cards, uh, card transactions, whereas it's about 8% that's made with cash. And of course, that, that piece has been trending down over time. So that is a, we, we don't do any adjustments for that, like that missing piece of spending, but it's true um, that we, we don't cover that. And um, so if you think about when I said before that we don't have a full business cycle and like feeling confident in these data, that is one where you might you might think that there could be shifts in the type of card spending. Now we do have credit and debit, so I mean we have kind of the cash like spending in here as well. And and the other thing that we um, struggle with in our measurement is the way we had to do our methodology in filtering is that we also miss economic births and deaths because we can't we can't we can't distinguish that from the massive amount of merchant churn, people coming in and out. And so that is another piece where um, one could worry about if there are changes in the economy and you have many more firms actually exiting, that that would be difficult. That's something we would miss in these data series. So I, I just want to be clear. There are a lot of things that are missing in what yeah. we're doing, and yet it looks Very like good. it, it Do you does. Have online? Capture. Sale, you have online sales? You have online retailers? Or? So we... Um, it captures electronic payments that are done with a card. We don't have, we, and those get uh, sorted into the merchant industry. So if it's like a clothing store, it would show up in the clothing industry. Unlike in the, the retail sales, often this will go into a non-store uh, setting. So we don't, we don't organize our data that way. It would go, um, but, but we can capture those. There's an ability in the data, because it's uh, card swipes, that we can look at, in some cases, the bank identification number, so we can learn a little bit more about what type of card it is. And for some cards, there is a flag for if card is present. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that's a scope to do more with the online spending in these data. All right, last question. Michaela. Hey, um, I'm Mikhail Krishnan from the McKinsey Global Institute. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I have two questions. The first is uh, you've characterized the use cases of this data as um, high-frequency localized effects, and I think part of that is because you can make the direct cause and effect relationship. But I was curious if you've thought about this for other use cases where maybe that cause and effect relationship isn't as apparent. Um, and then the second thing is I think you said this was merchant data but to the extent that these data have demographic information, say, around income levels, have you thought about, maybe this goes to the last session around privacy, um, but have you thought at all about integrating that into some of the findings? I could imagine some of the analysis you've done on the, the spending um, picking back up, that could look quite different across income segments. Right, and, and so because the data are merchant-centric, we, we can 
we can think about geography. So kind of the, the income level in the surrounding, um, I think we probably have the potential to have reasonable statistics maybe down to the county level. So you could, you could think about uh, impacts in higher or lower income areas. There, there's nothing to these data that would link us back to demographics of the individuals uh, swiping uh, their cards. Um, in terms of use cases for the data, I was what I was highlighting are, are features of these data that we don't have in official statistics. Um, as you've seen, we certainly look at these in the like national and monthly data. And and you know, as if you spend this much time building a data set, you start looking for ways uh, <laughs> uh, to apply it. So I'm also open to good ideas from others. So everything's a nail. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. Join me in thanking no Claudia. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.